So welcome everybody to the LID seminar for July. And this, this afternoon, we've got two speakers who are both in the UK, where it's very early in the morning. Um, and we've just had a few technical problems, but we've solved those. Um, so these two speakers should be well known to some of you. Uh, Jennifer Clegg, who's been associated with the Living with Disability Research Centre for a number of years. She's taught on the master's course um, and, and is a researcher uh, that's written extensively about issues for people with intellectual disability over a number of years. And Richard Landsman Welfare, who has been a consultant psychiatrist who worked with Jennifer also over a number of years in clinical settings, uh, but they've had a research partnership now for a long time. So they're going to uh, present the first half of the seminar is going to focus on the book that they've just written or have written has just been published, uh, which is available. Uh, you have to pay for to download it or you can get a hard copy. And the information about that was in the flyer, but we'll put it again um, before we go. And they're going to talk about uh, basically what is neoliberalism um, and how does that apply to issues for people with intellectual disabilities. So they'll start off, we'll have some questions and a, a very short break. And then in the second half, they're going to talk about how does neo, neo if you use a neoliberal lens, how might you consider what the Royal Commission thought about and how might you critique some of the work of the Royal Commission? Um, and that's from a paper that's about to be published in in Rapid in the special issue about the Disability Role Commission. So welcome, Jennifer. Over to you. Um, and yell out if you need anything. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to discuss this book, which has only been out a few weeks. And we look forward to having conversations with you all um, about how these ideas strike you. Um, I'm going to just summarize what neoliberalism is, I think because it's become a sort of general um, term of, of criticism, um, but exactly what it means perhaps can be a bit muddy. So um, let's start by looking at, you know, Hans Reinders, who was the head of the um, IACID ethics group for many years. Um, was interested in thinking how disability serves as a prism, and it does reveal, I think, some of the um, contemporary ideas which which drive a lot of policy at the moment um, and get reproduced in large numbers of places uh, internationally. And it's become, it seems to us, quite remarkable how dominant these ideas are and how little scrutiny there is about how suitable they are for the, the particular clients that we're interested in. So let's start with what it what it is. Hayek um, was an economist, an Austrian economist who observed the rise of fascism um, in Germany. And his first book, The Road to Serfdom 44, was incredibly popular because he was seen as a commentator on how to avoid what had happened in Germany. Um, and he went on then to write a, a more considered book in 1960 and ultimately um, got the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1974. Um, the dominant ideas are that the state is not to be trusted um, and that state intervention leads to a loss of liberty and it always makes things worse. Um, and he introduced the idea we're now very familiar with that you let markets run, they're wiser than any individual um, and they should be given free reign. Um, it looks at a core idea that competition and choice are what make things good. Um, and it was particularly keen on individualism and autonomy um, and, and, and offers a fundamental challenge to collectivism. And in the UK, that was expressed by Margaret Thatcher, our prime minister from 1980, repeatedly saying there is no such thing as society. I only know about individuals. Um, and it was strategized, interestingly, um, Milton Friedman with Hayek put together a, a secret elite intellectual society uh, called the Mont Pelerin Society, because that's where it first met. It published nothing, but it targeted journalists and politicians and used those routes um, 
to, to um, develop its thinking. Um, this wonderful book by Stedman Jones, uh, Masters of the Universe, um, gives us a, a, an overview, and he argues there were some very early ideas about neoliberal individualism, um, uh, 1920 to 1950. 1950 um, uh, was when uh, he Hayek moved to Chicago. He moved from Austria to London to Chicago. Um, and then in the third phase that we're really going to be talking about from 1980 onwards, um, a lot of economic turbulence in the US and the UK in particular resulted it in being drawn into not just economics, but politics and culture by President Reagan and um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Um, and there was a clear shift of moral and financial responsibility away from the welfare state to the individual and their family. Um, and that has resulted in um, what Saad Filo from the UK has argued undermined the foundations of democracy altogether. Um, he has this clear statement that it's unre unresponsive and rigid and indifferent. Um, and he ends with this statement, each person for themselves. Interestingly, at the end of his 1960 book, Hayek positioned himself um, uh, as as not conservative. Um, neoliberalism was seen as between the right and the left, an alternative to those. And he wrote this wonderful um, takedown of conservatism, um, that it has no distinctive ideas of its own, um, distrust theory and uh, imagination, um, uh, which you might want to um, reflect on. So a, a notion, although it has been taken up by right wing politicians, um, that was not how Hayek thought about it. I think the other thing just to think about in terms of people with intellectual disability is Hayek um, actually did conceive of uh, a safety net necessary for the most vulnerable people. Um, you know, got there this 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 notion that you have to have some provision for those who are threatened by extremes of um, difficulty and difficult circumstances. But the Montpellerin society had then become more powerful than Hayek himself, although he he formed it um, and had individuals like um, von Mies and Karl Popper in there. And they were pushing through journalists and think tanks um, their own position. Um, and, and they were quite clear that the doctrine of the safety net had to go. Um, they, it, was, it, uh, it was not something that they were going to support. Um, so let's look at exactly what the key neoliberal ideas are. The voice, the user, the, and we all know as researchers you know, that the user has to be um, present in most projects now in order to get funding. It's it's become a, a, a very dominant requirement. Um, the idea of choice is very central. Um, having set up free markets, uh, you, you then give the consumer choice and you do that by giving them information. Accessible communication is fundamental to this idea because they can't make sensible choices if they don't have information about um, their options and what they can choose. I think one of the other dominant notions, more dominant in the US than the UK, but still very dominant everywhere, is that work is the neoliberal solution to all social problems. Um, and we come back to that again and again. Um, and so uh, here we're going to talk a little bit about um, how work is, is thought about um, in current policies for people with intellectual disabilities. I think one of the other issues is that corporations are considered blameless. They've been freed from the shackles of the state. Um, they are global, international often. Um, and uh, what we see is that individual people are blamed for wrongdoing, but not corporations. And so in the UK, when you look at the analysis of scandals in intellectual disability, for example, the Winterbourne one, um, uh, individual members of staff go to jail. And of course, there was great wrongdoing perpetrated by them. Um, but the, the managers who had set up a home, given them no training, provided them with no support, left them in a very difficult situation, um, are, are not called to account. Um, not one of them um, 
was was held to account for the dreadful um, uh, events happening at Winterbourne View. And I think the other thing that's very key is once you've got competitive league tables, which are how consumers can decide what's a good, bad or indifferent service, um, you're going to have to have some monitoring. And what does that, how's that done? Inspectors pluck out criteria against which services are monitored. And we will see, particularly in intellectual disability, that those criteria are not supported by the evidence. Um, but that it is claimed that they are. And the other thing that happens is that those criteria are um, set in stone. And so it becomes very difficult for innovation and research um, to evolve in the ways that it normally does, um, because it's become part of the, uh, the monitoring system uh, and becomes taken for granted um, the right thing to do. Um, and we also see increasingly staff time is taken in gathering up data to monitor that activity and the amount of time and energy and effort that goes into developing that um, monitoring um, is also not questioned. It's an ideology. Uh, Hondrich, a philosopher, wrote a, a great, uh, edited a great tome um, uh, of concept, what are the key concepts in uh, uh, in philosophy. It's a set of beliefs that are not justifiable in terms of uh, intellectual uh, endeavour. Um, and they are established and maintained in ways that resist challenges. And so we see the explanations that promote the core beliefs being deployed very frequently um, in all communications. Uh, those ideas are often going to reflect and serve the interests of dominant parties. And they invert features of reality to make the social order seem natural and just. And that's our curiosity. Um, and so, for example, Feynman Saad Philo, wonderful paper called 13 Things You Need to Know About Neoliberalism. Um, untrue claims, they make untrue claims that they've reduced the state. In fact, their total spend remains the same, if not more, but they have changed how it's spent. They've reduced the spend on welfare, but they have not reduced the total spend. Um, there are also untrue claims uh, uh, that the public sector, for example, is always inefficient. It, again, that it, you know that's that's a, a standard neoliberal um, assertion, um, uh, either referring to poor or non-existent research. When we look at intellectual disability, in particular, a couple of historians um, of psychology uh, have argued um, that behaviorism is an interesting topic. It survives in applied settings when, um, uh, from a long way back from Chomsky's critique onwards, behaviorism was criticized um, as in an inadequate explanation of human experience. Um, uh, and, and from the 50s and 60s, it started to be rejected by academic psychologists. And you'll see in many university libraries, most of the major behavioral journals uh, long since stopped being taken by um, those disciplines. Um, and yet it survives in applied settings, these historians argue, because its individualism and its positivism chime with a neoliberal culture. And it does lots of things um, that uh, fit well with neoliberal policies. Um, for example, uh, positive baby support, something I've been curious about how powerful it's become, really incredibly dominant. It's required from the UK to Australia across the world, even though research ratings um, for positive behavioural support in the UK, a big review, found the, the evidence to be low or very low quality. Um, and, uh, and the research review written for the Disability um, Royal Commission uh, argued that no single approach could address all types of challenge. Um, uh, that uh, Because the reasons people with intellectual disability are challenging, as we know, which is why we have multidisciplinary teams trying to problem solve those issues, is there is no single approach that are going to address all types of challenge. They come for a huge variety of reasons. So, but neoliberalism manages itself, it shape shifts, it maintains itself. And one of the ways it does that is hollowing out. Um, you replace public administrators with private contractors. Um, 
you import non-professional managers. And one of the ways in which that's done um, is by changing the rules of how can charities operate, for example. Um, so um, one of the papers Richard and I wrote was an analysis of the British Psychological Society in the year 2000 in response to changing rules about what a charity could and couldn't do, including that it may make no political statements, which is itself quite interesting. But there's a requirement to have non-professional managers. So for the first time in the year 2000, the British Psychological Society was run by um, people who were not psychologists. Uh, and um, and you can track then um, how, how that uh, changed and influenced the British Psychological Society. Dave Pilgrim has written a book called Psychology in Crisis very recently, um, arguing um, that, that really at that point, uh, we started to see a deterioration um, and a loss of the soul of what um, had been an extremely successful organization um, developing um, important um, research um, uh, that could be helpful to society. We see the widespread privatization and marketization and what that does is set um, groups of people who would normally be powerful uh, sources of dissent um, if they cooperated are set at each other's throats um, and the university sector in the UK um, is starting to see some universities going under um, and there is currently considered a, you know, a, a, a major threat that more may go. Um, and, uh, uh, and there is a, an argument that there is a, an unholy alliance between having set up this private market between universities in the UK um, but also um, a, a, a government criticism of spending too much money on university vice chancellors um, and, um, and on marketing, although um, obviously the, the, the context in which they operate and have to compete for students um, is exactly um, requiring that they do those sorts of things. You also forestall dissent because you have uh, oppressive data collection requirements. You busy people um, uh, with uh, uh, activities that are required. And most recently, this uh, a nice paper by Hornberg has argued that neoliberalism has combined with social media to produce what they call cultural homogenization, which they're talking about the way fat globules of cream are dispersed evenly across um, a pint of milk, um, that the same ideas are dispersed uh, internationally. You see them in the United Nations, we see them in the UK, we see them in um, Australia. The same ideas crop up again and again and again, and they become increasingly distant from the people that they're meant to be relating to. And so how and why does all this matter? There's been a, um, a fine analysis by Michael Power, who wrote a book in 97 called The Audit Society, um, which has been remarkably influential. And this is what he was saying at that point. We're looking at the dramatic increase in internal controls and self-auditing, people being required to scrutinize their own activity and report on it. Um, it's conceptualized as good risk management and good governance um, presented that way. And he was looking at how organizations were being reshaped to align themselves with financial auditing how did they count, account for performance in, in highly reductive ways some, sometimes? Um, uh, and again, and unquestioning ways. And what he, he found you know, was the book, was, was, it resonated across disciplines that were newly coming under surveillance. They were unaccustomed um, to having um, a scrutiny of their professional judgments. And that was happening across countries. And in a recent uh, article, um, he started, which was a review 25 years on of the Audit Society and the degree to which this was or was not the same. He argued that it, it had moved on a little and he coined this term datification. Um, oh, yes, and he was also had been yeah, just pointing out, and I think that you have to keep asking, all these surveillance um, uh, strategies that were set up by neoliberal states command enormous amounts of time and resource that could be used for other purposes. So accounting and auditing are increasingly reshaping architecture platforms. Um, and um, 
the uh, in the UK, this idea of platformization, uh, which he was talking about there, has been clear in, uh, it may or may not be uh, known in, in Australia, but we have a scandal um, in um, 500 plus sub postmasters were wrongly accused of having taken very substantial money out of the post office. Some went to jail as a result of it, all were ruined. Um, and there was this uh, a platform called Horizon, which was a, a, a data gathering platform that was just presumed to be right, even though it was giving um, hugely inaccurate data. Um, and, and so we've got that sense that we have these out of control, invisible algorithms um, that, that escape scrutiny and oversight. But most important for a social scientist, human int intimacy and interiority Michael Powell warns, are at risk. Whatever cut aspects of the social can't, social can't be digitally captured, risk being relegated to non-knowledge. As a psychologist, I cannot but be worried about that. I have been talking for some time now, and Richard and I have been writing on the importance of attachment theory within intellectual disabilities. Um, and I think that's one example of something which becomes very difficult to operationalize in many clinical services um, because the demand for um, other sorts of more easily evidenced um, ways of acting um, take precedence. So this analysis helps us to see, look around the margins of this dominant ideology about what's missing. So care. You know, we have uh, care ethics um, uh, has been a dominant part of intellectual disabilities, um, but it's it's not often operationalized in our uh, inspectorates. What sorts of connections? Uh, we'll talk a bit more about Deleuze and this sort of idea of connection in the, the second presentation. But essentially, Deleuze was very concerned about connections between apparently dissimilar things within an environment. Um, and you uh, that are actually, if you understand how those connections are working, you may be getting to grips with something really important about what happens in that place. Um, but because we focus on individuals, those connections get overlooked. And what sort of cooperative collectivities could be happening, should be happening, would make a difference if they were happening. Um, but again, um, they become obscured by a, a neoliberal individualist position. So there's now a number of publications which are saying, talking about after neoliberalism, um, there's a book which I think is quite weak about that, but are just starting to engage with what would life after neoliberalism look like? I think um, this um, article here is not mentioned in our book or um, the journal article, because I've only just discovered it. Um, uh, Davies and Gain give... Um, uh, an overview, they're the editors of a special edition of Theory, Culture and Society, and each of those papers is um, starting to debate what post-neoliberalism could be um, and, and what we might be moving on to. Um, and so, it, you know, it's referring to a set of emergent critiques, movements and reforms that are starting to weaken, make space, make something else possible. Um, they point to the importance of the pandemic. I think many people have been aware of how, uh, what a punctuation point that was for us. Um, and uh, it, it, they particularly arguing, we realize that neoliberal dismantling of collection, collectivities um, made us rethink, despite Margaret Thatcher's, there is no such thing as society, rethink what a renewed need to act upon society might mean. Um, and in general, that sense that monetary and business organisations have, um, you know, in the UK, uh, we have privatised water companies that are pumping all of our water full of sewage. Um, how do we reel back the crisis in the climate that, and, and, and in health that that's been causing um, so that we can um, uh, have a different understanding of society? So this is the, uh, an upbeat, you know, perhaps there is finally a Cunium shift in policy paradigm of neoliberalism. Others, Fine and Sardhilo, aren't quite so confident that it will be um, easily changed. And 
they do warn, of course, that um, as well as uh, moving on from neoliberalism, we were also seeing um, that this social change is creating room for a rise of authoritarian right. So it's not all good news. So the final slide here before we start to discuss these is just to remind her, these are the key points uh, in neoliberalism and um, I welcome your conversation and conversation. If you've got a question that you want to ask, please put it in the Q&A. Um, Richard, do you want to add anything at this point? Um, um, or should I ask you a question? Uh, ask me a question. <laughs> so, so if we stop collecting all this data and, you know, what Jennifer describes is happening in Australia too, we're seeing people in group homes more concerned with collecting bits of data and compliance than actually providing quality support to people. If we stop collecting that, as Jennifer suggests, um, how will we know whether things are better or worse for the people that are being supported by services? I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's an important question. I think I don't, we're not saying that you would never collect data. Um, I mean, one of the things we're going to be talking about is the Finnish education system. Um, and, but they still collect data. So it's in, it is important. And in fact, research, in a sense, demands data. I mean, I know there are kind of qualitative methods and, and, and stories and narration stuff, but we're not saying don't collect any data. Um, I think that what we're saying is that datification is a more kind of complex phenomenon where the data in a sense becomes a it becomes a form of subject subjectivity that then actually distances you from the subject um that actually you end up monitoring the data in a sense the data shapes your view of kind of reality and in doing that a lot of really important things like care um just drop drop from view i mean i'm aware that certainly locally in the uk we had some very effective um small scale not-for-profit charitable organizations involved with people with intellectual disability and mental health problems for instance um but because they were small they didn't actually have the mechanism for delivering for collecting all that data so what happened was when you get sort of austerity, they then say, well, prove what you're doing, show us your data, show us what you're doing is highly effective. Um, and of course, they, they haven't actually got the mechanisms to do that. And so what happens is they drop out of they drop out of view. And what happens then is very valuable work that often is around connecting people. Um, is actually looking at all those kind of more social care type aspects, they disappear. It becomes non-knowledge and in a sense, it becomes a non-service. Um, so I think that datification is a, yeah, is a more complex process than just gathering data. I think we need to gather data um, and we need to know something about effectiveness as well. But I think what happens is that the amount of data collection exceeds that. And, and in fact, in some ways, that's not. It almost becomes a sort of, if you like, the virtue statement as to why we put so much business, so much fairly meaningful, da meaningless data collection into the system. Does that make sense? It does to me. Um... Jennifer, do you want to just just click on stop sharing your screen? Because all we can see now is the blank screen. That's it. That's good. Is there any so is there anything you want to add to that, Jennifer? Richard was talking about we're not talk, that you weren't promoting the idea of not collecting any data, but it's the type of data that you collect, I think, that's that you're suggesting is important and the onerous nature of it. Yes. And what it focuses and on. Yes. Um, and I think we should also look at um, some uh, uh, 
little eruptions of alternative ideas that seem to be exciting, but then don't survive. And I think it's partly because we're in this particular neoliberal environment. So in the UK, there was a flourishing uh, uh, from the 90s and the noughties uh, of family therapy. A number of us trained as family therapists. There were a number of publications on family therapy. There was a huge excitement on it uh, and thinking um, both about how families operate, but also taking a systemic view about how care systems operate. Uh, and um, but as uh, 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 Myself and a colleague taught a great deal about that in Nottingham and, and Leicester to clinical psychology students who all wanted to train in this technique, but the possibility of training in this technique disappeared because the demand was for positive behaviour support. The only funding for further training beyond your original professional training was for positive behaviour support, and they could not get the time and resource um, permitted that I'd been able to access and that uh, that generation of clinicians had been able to access. And as you well know, social workers were, of course, very dominant in family therapy techniques. But they all it's all simply disappeared um, in the last decade. There have been virtually no publications in family therapy um, journals about uh, intellectual disability and that 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 move of excitement and therapeutic intervention was almost snuffed out. Um, and and uh, I have um, been involved with some Europeans um, looking at what they've called psychomotor therapy. Um, which is a, a, a mixture of psychological therapy and physiotherapy. Uh, and um, again, um, I know uh, Claudia Emke in the University of Amsterdam um, and colleagues in, in Zwolle University, uh, where psychomotor therapy has been excitingly developed, where you're looking at um, how, how do people respond to their bodily um, uh, messages uh, when they're starting to um, struggle. Uh, and um, that is also coming under threat, although there are increasing PhDs and publications coming out about that. Again, I think because it doesn't fit the neoliberal understanding of we want this sort of data uh, and not that sort of data. Um, and so the possibility of doing exciting new things that are useful and helpful for people with intellectual disabilities um, is under threat. Uh, and um... so just looking at some of the questions, what is this sort of data versus that sort of data? Right. So the question to Richard is, so what sort of data would you collect? And, and why is it that collecting certain types of data stops those sort of creative new developments that you're talking about, Jennifer? Um, so are you putting that to Richard or me? <laughs> Well, either of you. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, you go ahead. Well, I think I think it's I think there's also something about the frequency of data collection as well. That quite often what we we collect rafts of data and you and I suppose there is a legitimate discussion about well what is legitimate and what isn't. But we seem to collect it all the time and you kind of think why do we do that because we don't necessarily act on it in that kind of time frame so you think if you want to look at a trend so why don't we collect a data set um every three months or every six months rather than this sort of we must have a you know, some kind of live thing so that we 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 know exactly what's happening in real time, which, of course, is kind of it's this sort of spurious sort of sense that we know everything all the time. Um, uh, and we don't. And I remember actually in Nottingham, um, we were both involved with our. Um, um, an assessment ward where people would. Um, uh, be admitted when actually when they were kind of in extremely distressed states um and so what we did was we looked at and we thought well actually there's just too much data collection and there was a concern about well how would we know whether this particular unit was getting into trouble and so what we did was, um, I think with a colleague, Jennifer, didn't we? We looked at like, well, what 
when you look at the academic research, what three or four measures can give you a reasonable indication that actually you might be in trouble on your particular unit? Um, and I think we identified four or five. We said, well, OK, what we'll do, uh, we'll collect those every so often and things like turnover and you know how open the service etc cetera, etc cetera. um but could we make that because no because the the organization wanted the sort of 30 to 40 to 50 things measured every you know what I mean it was kind of like but but quite often none of that data was actually acted upon so I think there's a kind of sense of if Think about what the issue is and then kind of say, well, what data would be helpful to collect, to steer, maybe to give some early highlights of difficulties and then collect those rather than um, the sort of she's and she's of data. And then you go to a meeting, you've got all these kind of charts and graphs and and then you have to do exception reports because most of it's not changing. But there's actually that whole burden. I mean, there were people who were employed just to put this stuff together. Mm -hmm. And often they weren't the people who actually worked in the service. So there's this automatic disconnect between the data collectors and analyzers and actually the service. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, it just rings so many bells. It's like what you're talking about is having some really core evidence-based sort of yes that actually relate to what good practice looks like. And I mean, Jim Mansell talked about this stuff 20, 30 years ago. That if yeah, you wonderful take, so, yes. You know, if you yeah, take yeah. this two hour snapshot uh, different uh, in a service, that will give you a representative of what's happened for the whole of the period of, you know, for the all yeah. day. And yeah. we've been doing that once a year for services. And, you know, the organizations say, yeah, that reflects what happens here all the time. Um, so, yeah, it's about how much you connect, you collect and the sort of evidence beneath it is what you're saying, I think. Yeah, yeah. So and also, I, also what data you need to, to decide to go into a service that looks like it's heading for trouble rather than automatically scrutinising every service all the time. Um, you know, and it will be high staff turnover. It will be the loss of a manager and a difficulty of replacing. The, uh, most of our inquiries, that was one of the first things that tumbled. You didn't have a professional nurse or social worker or, or doctor who's responsible to an external professional um, uh, organization. Uh, you've got then a, a gap and you then get an unqualified person with no external connections to a professional discipline. Um, and then you're starting to get an unraveling. Um, quite quickly, three or four years. Uh, um, and, you know, so there, I mean, there clearly are indicators that would say we should be worried about this service um, that you could be using rather than this endless, endless inspectorates that cost enormous amounts of money. OK, so there's two main things coming through on the, from the from the audience, um, remembering that most of them probably haven't read your book um, or heard you talk about this before. There's a thread here about positive behavior support. Um, and one person says, can you explain why is it a neoliberal concept? And I guess connected to that, in passing, you said very clearly that there's actually very limited evidence or the evidence is low and low, very low quality. So can you talk about where that came from and why PBS is a neoliberal concept and that will do for the time being. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I, and it will be a surprise. It is a it is a surprise to people that we're taking that position. I understand that. Um, uh, it, we have some data which will come up in the second presentation that that sends you to some of these sources. Um, but fundamentally, the low and low quality was a review in the UK, which led into. It, it, I mean, an enormous review um, uh, sponsored by the government, uh, led by the British Psychological Society and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, mm. which, um, I, I mean, one might argue used inappropriate criteria. So the low and low quality is because they regarded as high quality uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. Actually, if you if you look at that that sort of strategy, 
A, for people with intellectual disabilities who are enormously heterogeneous in terms of their abilities, uh, in terms of the pattern of difficulties. Some have um, uh, genetic conditions, some have uh, organic damage, others don't. If you look at histories, some have histories, childhood histories of considerable abuse, others don't. Um, Challenging behavior is not one thing, so you can't stick it into a randomized control trial, actually. Um, it's simply not doable. And, and when you look at the data on randomized control trials, um, they, they will rule out um, including people with intellectual disability because they are too mixed. Um, so, you know, you can, you can argue all sorts of questions, but um, uh, 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 nevertheless, their, their, their reviews of particular topics uh, within, within this review, each um, virtually all of them um, concluded the evidence was low or very low quality. But in the executive um, summary, it said, nevertheless, um, overall, PBS is the best thing to do. Um, you get this extraordinary inversion. And I suspect it's because neoliberalism needs a single answer that you can hold up services against. You're not doing it. This is the right way. Um, and its demand to have that uh, feeds the monitoring system. Um, and and so uh, we will also give you a quotation from the disability, the Royal, the Australian um, Disability Royal Commission, which again said there is no single off the shelf model that will work. Um, don't do it. Uh, and yet you get in your summary statement, you can only do restrictive practices if there's also, it doesn't quite say PPS, but it does say a behavior support plan. Um, you can only have restrictive practices if there's a behavior support plan in place, um, ignoring completely the uh, review that they themselves had commissioned. And what about why it's a neoliberal approach? Well, the historians Yes, it, they say it chimes with, so it, it, it because it's individualist, it doesn't look at relationships. It, I mean, PBS uh, exponents will say, oh, yes, you can put attachment in there. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you look at the statements about what PBS is, it says it, it, it accommodates intellectually, conceptually compatible ideas. I would argue there is no way is attachment a conceptually compatible idea with behaviorism because behaviorism rejects the in, the inner life. It doesn't pay and it and it doesn't look at relationships. Um, the historians say th that simply the concepts, it's individualism and it's it's positivism, it's it's um, a historicism. All of those sorts of strands of thinking chime with neoliberalism and so it's comfortable it fits neoliberalism very well it's not exactly a neoliberal intervention yeah. okay, and i think there's something about pbs i mean it's i think we mentioned this kind of idea of neoliberalism kind of distorting the nature of reality and i think pbs is one of those examples it kind of you know you start doing the pbs plan and it, it it sort of feels as though somehow, well, you are trying to take all these different domains and look at them and whatever. And I think that it sort of seduces you into thinking all these things can be all like you put them all in a mixer and then you get this really rich thing that is actually then effective. And But it doesn't actually look at the, if you like, the theoretical... The, the research evidence behind the kind of interventions, it just all mashes them together. And I think actually what you, you don't actually get a rich mix. I think you get a sort of bastardized version, if you like, of if you're going to do attachment, do it well. If you're going to do family work, do it well. If you're going to do psychomotor stuff, do it well. I think that in some ways there's this sort of spurious thing that PBS covers all bases. It's a sort of it's a sort of one of those sort of toes, you know, those sort of theory of everything. It's a sort of it becomes and then actually what happens is if you people then say, Well, has this person got a PBS plan? Tick. No further inquiry. <laughs> it only takes <laughs> three actually, hours. You've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, and I, it doesn't really, it stops interrogation of anything deeper. Yeah. And that's why I think it, in a sense, it's a sort of cultural therapeutic, if you like, 
expression of a neoliberal idea, neoliberal neoliberal thinking. Okay, so just one last one before we move on. Um, somebody who really doesn't agree with you, who is saying, <laughs> isn't there a contradiction between individual individualism and homogenization? So PBS is individualized. So what's the if it's individualized, then how can it be this idea of homogeneity that that you're talking about? I think the homogeneity is about the therapeutic approaches. I think that also that it kind of aligns itself with it with neoliberalism in the sense is this. I mean, one of the critiques of neoliberalism is it's sort of hyper individualization. It sort of takes people out of their social context, be that the family, the people that's with them. So they're, they're only given a sort of passing, they're, they're almost like stage props in terms of the person, in the sense that actually challenge behaviour is often, you know, there's a whole kind of relational interactive stuff, and that often isn't really attended to properly it's a kind of um it's a very kind of interior model that somehow the challenge of behavior rises from the person i yeah i think um i think it's one of these sort of over individualistic hmm. uh things which brings us to the idea that individualism is is you know a bit problematic sometimes but yeah. we i think we've all absorbed it um, and so there's a there's a there's a sort of comment from somebody who's very experienced that says, you know, this is how we ended up with the NDIS, where it doesn't have any connect care, doesn't have issues of care and connectivity, you know, built into it because it's it's been datified and and sort of objectified and individualized. But on the other hand, then somebody says, well, the principles of our NDIS are about choice and control, um, and they're very individual. So what in your mind, then, would be a, an equivalent scheme or provision of services that weren't built on neoliberal values. So what would a post-neoliberal NDIS look like? Now, that's a big question, but I'm sure you've got some ideas about what a post-neoliberal system might look like. Um, I, I would love if um, it would make more space for... Uh, innovation and experimenting experimentation about what difference it might make if you took a relational view. Um, we do actually talk about some of this in the next presentation. Um, uh, but but to take an example, if you ask advocacy groups, they will say they want jobs, they want work, and work is very 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 dominant in NDIS. Extraordinarily, as we will look at the data in the next presentation. Uh, a, a recommendation that open employment should be a goal for every person with intellectual disability in the NDIS, even though less than five and in some studies less than one percent of people with intellectual disabilities have a job. And I can only imagine the the parents with somebody who is non-ambulant, not speaking, doubly incontinent, needing uh, 24 hour care, being asked to put in their goal an open employment goal. Um, it's an extraordinary requirement, which is to do with neoliberalism rather than anything that's connected to those individuals and what they might need and want and their families. Okay. Richard, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and I think that... Um, I think neoliberalism changes our subjectivities. I think it changes the way we think about things. Um, and so one of the things is it makes it makes the current situation seem normal, natural. There is no other water to swim in. We are fish in the sea. There is any one type of water. So it takes, if you like, quite an effort to remove oneself from that sea and say the world could be different. So we could look at care, we could look at the social, we could look at the collective, we could to some extent bracket. I mean, no, I'm not saying we would never, cons I mean, obviously individuals, you know, we want to be considered as individuals, we do want elements of choice, but can we not bracket those um, 
to some extent and say, if we look to other big things that I've previously mentioned, where does that take us? Um, because there are other really important things about, well, how do I feel as though I belong to a community or to a group of people? Um, how might I, you know, how might I develop some sense of meaning in my life? You know what I mean? Those things are also important. But if you just say it's all about choice, it's all about voice, then lots of other very important things don't get any space. They don't get any airtime. And that's interesting. I mean, I think we've been saying forever the significance of of relationships and of people, particularly with more severe and profound disabilities, having a network of relationships outside of service systems. And yet we've invested almost no resources okay, in actually right. building those relationships. We say people need to have voice in the service, but there's nobody to help them have that voice because we haven't that's attended right. to their their networks. It's it's like yeah. I, I can see a picture where we might invest much more money in building relationships and connections than, than we have in the past. But absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're worried about staff turnover, as other services are worried, and they do something about it. And we never do anything about the high staff turnover in our services. Um, but actually, it stops any development. Um, mm -hmm. All staff training is, you know, goes down the plug hole if you've got staff turning over every six months. So one last question before we have a, a break, and this is probably a bit of a challenge. So Alan says he'd be interested to hear on your take on the issue of human rights which has a strong individualistic focus. So what what would be your critique around human rights, given your critique of neoliberalism and individualization? Oh, well, I, I think I, the next topic really is to look at UNCRPD in much more detail. 2006, you know, the 90s and the noughties, high neoliberal periods. And we keep hearing about the rights of people with intellectual disabilities that need to be uh, um, uh, protected. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, the whole rights conversation, which is also legalistic. Uh, and I think some of that is inspired by the US, which tends to look more to lawyers and the law than, than traditionally we have done in the UK, although we're starting to take that habit um, uh, and have more uh, money squandered on legal legal inquiries. Um, uh, yes, is is UNCRPD uh, an ultimately neoliberal document that is far too influential? I suspect it might be, but I haven't looked at all of it. I've looked at bits of it, uh, and I think it's ripe for review. I think a lot of um, United Nations um, influence is ripe for review. Yeah, and I suppose. Um... I think rights are important, but they they tend to be a kind of, they're legal. They're at the very cold end of things. Um, and so I kind of think, so what's at the warm end of the spectrum? So you might say, well, I've got a human right to X, Y, and Z. Does that guarantee me a welcome in my community? So I kind of think I'd like to look at some of the, the warmer end of the, if you like, of the, I'm not sure it's a spectrum, but it, what's at the warmer, more human end of things, as well as, if you like, the legal? Because I think they are assertions, but it, but kind of like, how do you actually then, how then do you make, how do you help people then to feel that they really are part of a community? Um, yeah, I think I'd like, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the warmer end of stuff. Okay, thank you. That's a lovely answer. Uh, just before we, we finish off this section, there's a, just a comment from, from Jess Southwell, um, who I, th I think makes a very important point. Um, he says, you know, if it's really hard to measure because there's so many different inputs and outputs and types of things that services are trying, you know, to provide, um, isn't one of the most feasible ways of tackling that is to is to standardize and mandate some of the skills for the people that are going to be providing services? Like what's your take on 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 sort of 
having skills and training as prerequisites for being involved in services for people with intellectual disabilities? Oh, <laughs> I think um, necessary, but not sufficient. I think what I mean by that is, um, I think obviously people need skills. I think there's a question of what skills do they actually need? Mm -hmm. And quite often we look at the more technical side of things. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about attachment, for instance, is it looks at you as a person. So what's your attachment style as a, as a staff member? And actually it's quite hopeful because actually you can have an, a number of attachment styles but can work very successfully uh, with people with an intellectual disability. So I think that, again, there's a kind of, um, can we widen the lens as to what actually skills are? Because we tend then to look at skills. Well, what happens is we tend to look at things that we can collect data about. So then we kind of say, well, what are the skills that are actually is quite difficult to collect data around and they may be important as well. Um, I think, I mean, I mean Carlo Schungel, I think, would be very wary, a, a attachment expert, of, of scrutinising people's attachment status before you employ them. And it's intrusive. I think he would be um, uh, very concerned about going that far. Uh, and as Richard said the, and quoted the research that, that Carlo did, which, which, which uh, uh, you know, with a volunteer group of staff who were happy mm. to have attachment scrutiny um, uh, looked at as part of their of their work um, that everybody uh, even if they were starting from a, a more avoidant uh, or a more preoccupied position um, uh, could could become uh, better at relating could learn uh, some of the things that were required but imposing that on a set of staff I think um, where it would be authoritarian and unacceptable. I think it needs to I don't be... think I was I wasn't suggesting no, 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 that. no, 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 that's right. Yes. I think we would have to be very careful going up that going up that line. Um, but I think I, I think Richard's point about necessary, right, is yes. is really important. Like at the moment we don't necessarily employ people who have a set of skills. Yes. Um, but it's not sufficient because it needs to go with people's values or orientation. Yeah. Um, in the particular context that they're working so there's, there's two important things there but but values and orientation aren't necessarily enough if you're working with people with intellectual disabilities where you need actually a set of skills to think about yeah. how you're going to support somebody to be engaged for example and absolutely but I, but I think a, a sympathetic uh, engagement with the plight of the staff some of the time uh, and uh, you know and 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 their their willingness to do uh, a variety of things we need to go with the grain of of them as human beings as well well you've satisfied two of our questioners so that's good so <laughs> <laughs> fantastic set of questions thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs> jennifer's going to talk to this article and you can see that it's now published in research and practice in intellectual and developmental disabilities which is published by taylor and francis on behalf of acid and which uh, Alan Hoff and myself have guest edited. And it's got an amazing collection of articles just like this, which ask lots of questions about the Royal Commission. And this is probably the most, the most questioning article. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support for these ideas and this discussion. Um, let's think what we were taking on here. Um, so we are offering a critique of the Disability Royal Commission, and I am assuming, because it's um, something that um, uh, Latrobe, uh, Lids at Latrobe have been looking at for some time, and um, I believe the first special edition is already out, is that right, Chris? Yep. It, yep. So, yeah. so we've already got uh, one edition of, uh, 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 of Rapid um, discussing the critique of the Royal uh, um, commissions in legal inquiry <laughs> coming out, and and there's a second version coming out in, in which um, our contribution appears. Um, and Alan and uh, Christine have done a huge amount of work on um, understanding what the Royal Commission is about. Um, I'm going to talk about three particular things: um, the curiosity of accessible information. 
which relates um, to uh, the UNCRPD indeed. Um, the uh, attempt to eliminate restrictive practice. Um, and I, we're going to argue it, it fails because it chases fool's gold in seeking one answer. And we've already started talking about that. And also the, one of its other problems is it, it ignores the needs of staff and parents because it's so focused on the individuals. And thirdly, we're going to come back to this issue of paid work, um, which um, is uh, presented as the only meaningful adult life that the, the commission envisages. It offers, as far as I can see, no other suggestion about what might make a meaningful adult life post-school, even though meager and shrinking numbers of people with intellectual disabilities are in jobs. So um, those are the three things we're going to particularly look at. So let's start with accessible information. Um, the the uh, Royal Commission uh, quotes UNCRPD 2006, but the people have a right to information. Um, as we started saying, there's, there's lots of lots of rights you know you have a right to what a landscape a fatherland a the number of rights people have is is ever expanding it seems i'm quite sure where all these rights come from exactly um obviously it's been used uh you know to defend people from compulsory uh, sterilizations and so on the, the uh, dreadful abuses that ha happened in the past to people with intellectual disabilities i, I mustn't um dismiss the the importance um, of individual rights but perhaps they get more attention than some other things that might be equally important uh, in terms of accessible information what do we know i mean again in in the royal commission interestingly there's there's a quotation from a, 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 an organization which uh, translates and produces accessible information criticizing how it was done uh, in the Royal Commission because they didn't do it right. And, and the, the uh, implicit uh, uh, backdrop to that comment uh, is we would have done it better, um, which just underlines the degree to which competition also exists amongst those putting in for grants for accessible information. Um, and, um, and, and there isn't you know, one shared standard. There, is, there hasn't really been a sharing of the literature. Everybody does it a bit differently. Um, and uh, and when um, Deborah Chin, I'll uh, come to her work uh, further down, looked at how easy read uh, health information um, was being developed, uh, she was looking a lot at uh, health information um, uh, where they are required to have accessible information about particular procedures. Um, and people pay at very short notice um, for some quite technical materials to be translated. And in the end of the day, most of the work was being done by the charity um, and not really by the people with intellectual disability who couldn't work at the pace required to hit the deadlines um, and for whom um, uh, the technical information um, was difficult to grasp. But um, if you go back to uh, a systematic review done by Southern and Isherwood and their own Deborah Chin's meta-analysis, the impact of accessible information on people with IDs, the, their ability to understand it, um, is uniformly disappointing. Uh, they only found one study out of all those that they reviewed that suggested that people had understood it. Um, and there are other informal studies which, uh, if you put uh, things on notice boards uh, and then um, that the people walk past for six months and then have an array of pieces of paper and say, which of these have you seen before? Um, people don't pick out the ones that have been on their notice board for six months. And we would argue, although not with a great deal of evidence, um, um, but some from uh, Edgerton onwards, uh, social anthropologists looking at how people live, how people with intellectual disabilities live, they, they largely live in an oral culture. That if they want information, they ask people they trust. Um, so the idea that you're producing these pieces of paper with pictures or whatever um, as, as feeding into where people with intellectual disabilities get their information, you haven't started necessarily from the right place. Manda was one of the first to say, it's not a practical means for enhancing choice making, but expressing enthusiasm for it is a marker of ideological commitment. People feel they ought to be saying this sort of thing, um, which is, is one of the things we're trying to um, underline and perhaps uh, release people from. Um, 
Deborah Chin, having looked at the research groups that were producing easy read information, also concluded um, that its enthusiasm for this communication is a manifestation of neoliberal politics. Um, and it is valued. Charities, you know, it allows charities to generate a, a, a sociable occupation that people with intellectual disabilities find meaningful. They go somewhere high status. Uh, they have a, a, a regular set of meetings which um, give them a sense of belonging and, and presence. Um, it, it's serving a function that is not to do with generating the information. Um, uh, and, and that fills a vacuum because if you haven't got a job, and we'll come back to that, um, uh, and uh, the idea of day centres um, has become widely questioned as warehousing uh, in a meaningless institutional way, but we haven't really grasped what would be a meaningful life apart from work. Um, and um, But we, we're spending a lot of money on this and it's not really working. Um, would be the conclusion that we reach. There's a lot of thinking about how do you manage restrictive practices. Um, it's obviously a dominant, uh, you know, part of the core of of the the uh, uh, disability uh, commission's inquiry, um, and it seems to have been influenced by again UNCRPD here, uh, on Article sixteen point five. You have to ensure instances of exploitation, violence and abuse are identified, investigated and, where appropriate, prosecuted. Um, and so people have been um, responding to that for some time. I think Norway was the first to pass uh, legislation about this. Um, and so it's got the longest history and um, some interesting research is coming from there. Um, Alan Hoff, amongst others, um, Christine, uh, uh, you know, have been looking about the what what politics researchers call consociates that that set of staff and family, often mothers, um, uh, who find themselves uh, uh, in the firing line of people who can hurt them uh, and occasionally killed by them. Uh, we don't have good data on that. Uh, Clifford simply can pull together. Um, some material often um, generated by mothers or about mothers um, who on their own um, can be particularly vulnerable. Uh, and um, the, the whole discussion in the Disability uh, Commission is just about eliminating um, the things that are done to people uh, with intellectual disabilities without thinking what were the difficult circumstances people were, were attempting to manage um, in the process of doing that. And so we haven't had any conversation really about the supporters who are left exposed because these are individuals who are not safe to leave alone. And so they are present at horrifying self-injury, um, fecal smearing, verbal and physical violence, um, the sequelae of uh, huge emotional distress. Um, and there is a, a, a feeling the care ethics, in particular, Stacey Clifford Simplican, also associated with LIDS, um, you know, has talked about um, uh, the, the whole tradition of care ethics really isn't just looking at um, the mothers who themselves are threatened, um, that their lives are unintelligible um, if you're not careful in disability studies. Um, and 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 the whole situation of mothers in neoliberal states, Mayer would say, um, have been um, responsibilized would be one of the new words. You've been made increasingly responsible um, while you're being given less and less support for the work that you're doing. Um, I'm particularly critical of uh, violent episodes where mothers uh, have on their own with uh, uh, an increasingly distressed uh, adult child who is... Um, putting them under some threat um, and you call the, the, the services and the services immediately assume that um, it is uh, the mother who is at fault, even though in fact um, she was wounded and needed, needed um, physical support to go and get some hospital treatment. Um, uh, and the assumption uh, is, is that the person with intellectual disabilities um, is the one who needs the support. Um, so, there are some some missing parts of the picture if you take the individualist view, um, and and uh, we spent some time in the article talking, you know, about um, how how you can get that broader picture, um, and why it might be important to do so. 
a lot of the focus is on staff settings. I have to say implicitly, I think a lot of the discussion um, uh, and John Taylor has has been discussing some of the same, um, uh, you know, is 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 focused on staff settings, even though, as Shakespeare said, in fact, the most likely site of abuse is the family. Um, and um, people with intellectual disabilities, Trent historian said, have have historically and now um, been abused in all settings, in the family home, in organized settings and institutions and in the community. But we keep coming back to staff settings as if if we eliminate um, challenging behavior uh, and restrictive practices from staff settings, or if we can't, the best way to eliminate it is to shut them all. Um, and then the problem will go away, which is really a bit naive and fails to look at the difficulties of staff. And so this is the first review. Martin Hospital's in trouble, I think, reviewed the first tranche of um, inquiries into dreadfully abandoned and abusive uh, institutions um, in the UK that were being mirrored in uh, uh, you know, horror uh, in the US and uh, across the world in, in what had been happening in places. Um, but, but his review of these the various inquiries talked at the plight that staff were left in, the degree to which the, the manager of a service for 44 um, difficult people and with a staff team of three were, were frightened uh, by the responsibility that they had. And that, as he's saying here, I'll leave you to read it for yourself, the greatest failures are those who appear unresponsive. This is difficult work. And here I put in bold uh, emphasis added, the preservation of rights is simpler to achieve than a solution to the problem of how staff can retain and develop a balanced sense of humanity. And I think Richard and I, you know, when we were working in these services, you do think, how do you keep staff on the front foot, positive, engaged, supported, um, uh, able to do this very demanding work? Um, and, and yet it seems the plight of the staff are, are really not recognised at all. Um, I think the neoliberal solution has been to increase bureaucracy, who can write a restrictive pra practices plan um, uh, and then uh, and increase the amount of monitoring and you start gathering data. Um, that's what everybody does. And uh, the result is an immediate and dramatic increase in the recorded use of restrictive practices. I mean, it's quite clear that this is um, outing um, something that had been going on widely, but not recorded. Um, and the um, Disability Commission itself records that the first in the first year, I think 20 to 21, um, you know, it went up by 50 percent because everybody was just starting to record what had been happening, um, but not been being written down. But the interesting thing about that dramatic surge uh, in, in recorded use um, is that a study of uh, in Norway of, of these records over 10 years found it hadn't diminished. Um, and uh, and the staff were saying they, they thought the managers of those services thought it was most unlikely it would diminish. And so the question when you set up this enormous bureaucracy um, for monitoring these services is if it, if it doesn't make it come down, um, why would you continue? Um, and as we've already discussed, and why would you require PBS or behavior support plans? You can only do restrictive practices if you've got a uh, behavior uh, support plan in place. Uh, why would you require that when your own commissioned research uh, rejected any single model? And this is where the uh, Royal Commission ex explicitly um, uh, quotes their, their commissioned review, the Reducing Restrictive Practices Review, down halfway down this quote. Um, initiatives need to be tailored to the environment and population cohort may involve developing bespoke models rather than choosing a single model off the shelf. But monitoring, the whole monitoring fabric and structure requires, there's one right way of doing things, you're not doing it, um, and we're pointing you to it. Um, and that's just very problematic. And let's come back to, we started touching on this. Um, why, why, why are we looking at the, the notion that work is the solution to social problems? Um, uh, here's the data. Internationally, minimal employment rates of people with ID, and they're reducing, not improving. 
um, that was one review. Here's just one example of many, I think, of the, of the work created research that I've been looking at. Bayer et al, the Welsh group, they had 262 young people with intellectual disabilities. Um, six of them, after two years of support, got jobs. Less than 1% of a, high, of a healthy, highly motivated, trained and supported set of people, less than 1% got a job. Um, and in Australia, um, Moore et al's NICE study um, were looking at um, uh, the impediments. Equal opportunities legislation was one impediment. They were looking at a, a, a company that had been positive about um, employing people with ID and job carving. I, I understand it's called where you take somebody with a particular set of skills and interests and create a job around those interests that they can do. Um, uh, and they were prevented from doing that. They had to write a job description, publish it in the open market. Um, and um, of course, people without disabilities turned out to be uh, more fitted to those jobs and people with intellectual disabilities, you could not employ them. Um, and the other issue, uh, uh, they were talking 2018, and no doubt that's uh, only galloped, is lots of work processes are now driven by uh, computer, uh, handheld computers uh, that structure what people do, that the people with intellectual disabilities do not understand and can't manage. Um, and so we get to Wendelburg. Most countries pursue an explicitly stated goal of increased employment rates, yet uh, research can, you know, Employment is meagre amongst people with intellectual disabilities um, and, and the, the marginal labour market uh, appears to apply across borders. And yet the Commission continues, as I've said, to recommend the NDIS require open employment goals in plans for each person with ID. But you're talking about tiny percentages of people who are likely to get work. Um, and uh, uh, Hans Reinders has said, you know, neoliberalism and choice uh, absolves groups from difficult topics like what else might people do during the day once they've left school, uh, an issue of considerable concern to parents um, and the people with ID themselves, um, because work is not the solution um, or it's not a solution that's going to work. So. We offer other other neoliberal critiques of the Disability Commission, but it largely focuses around those three topics. And so for the remainder of this presentation, um, I just want to start sharing some of the things we've been interested in um, about where else we're going to get ideas from. Um, and the philosopher who's written the most about creativity is Deleuze and tends to um, be somebody, uh, a variety of uh, people from social science and art architecture um, refer to when they're starting to think, where do you get ideas from? Um, and this book, Difference and Repetition, was what he regarded. He wrote a number of histories of uh, ideas, and this is uh, the first he regarded as um, a statement of um, his own philosophy. Um, when you talk about Deleuze, people often uh, look at other work he did with Gattery, which was about schizophrenia and um, uh, psychoanalysis, um, but that wasn't the work um, that we've been drawing on. Um, so what he says essentially is um, you make a difference not by leaping away from what is, but by um, studying very carefully what's there as opposed to what you think might be there. Um, and and perhaps changing yourself first um, so that you can see what's there. Um, and, and I think we are saying with neoliberal lenses, um, we are, are, are working in ways that don't connect very well to the actual lives of people with intellectual disability. And I haven't mentioned here, but we do in the book, um, the growing uh, work from social anthropology, which is starting from how people actually live um, rather than how um, other positions might suggest they might live. So Deleuze is interested in a philosophy of becoming not being. And so one of the things he starts from is your analysis should always include time. So if we talk about words like belonging, relationships, community, you are automatically putting time in there. And that's, of course, much more difficult to measure in your monitoring systems. Um, but um, 
how do connections work? How do connections get formed and work would be the starting question that is underlying a lot of our critique and our concern and a lot of um, our thinking about clinical practice for people who are distressed. Um, you understand an environment by understanding how it changes. And so it's always easier to talk about physical environments rather than emotional ones. Um, um, and uh, the Australian artist John Wolseley, for example, lives in an environment for three months before he produces artworks based on it. And, it, and he looks at things like sand dunes and the winds that move and shape them. How, how is this environment dynamic? What's going on? I'm not producing a still life here. Life is not still. Um, you un so how do you go into an environment and understand how it moves and changes? Um, and so understanding a situation is, is, is looking at what is frequent, that is it's significant, but also dynamic. And so it's looking for repetitions, variations, how things echo each other. Um, and it's changing yourself so that you realize how things relate in a way that creates a new understanding of the situation. So here's just one example of architect um, Zaha Hadid, recently died, worked in London, internationally famous, considered one of the top 10 architects in the world. And she was influenced by uh, Deleuzean ideas. Um, and she sought to create uh, radical spaces that have disparate elements that should be connected or could be more connected. And um, it might be important and it might change the environment if you do connect them. And one of her first really fantastic buildings was the BMW factory in Leipzig, which is a figure of eight, where instead of having the office work and the managers and the sales representatives um, in, in the nice clean space and the manufacturing um, in a, you know, a noisy manufacturing and in, uh, in, a, in a other dirty place and, and all of those engineers and mechanics kept separately, these two things were combined um, in, a, in a figure of eight, which had the cars going round and round the offices in this proud sense of we make beautiful cars um, and that the office workers and, uh, are as important as the manufacturers. Um, and, and it was the start of thinking about buildings and, and environments that have nodes where disparate things can, can come together and can connect. She also wrote, she also built Maxi, the Museum of the 21st Century in Rome. And again, the, it's all about nodes, staircases, connections. Um, and you come to a, a social environment thinking, how do you facilitate the exchange of ideas, the connections between people? And it's very exciting stuff. But anyway, it, it, I, I'm using this, I hope, just because it gives a visual connection of something that in our services for people with intellectual disability, wouldn't be visualized in this way, but it would allow us um, to start thinking about it differently. So if we take that sort of perspective, what might be different? I'm just going to talk about these three things, um, not because I think these are the in any way the only things, but to get the ball rolling and to hear from other people about That's alternatives, right. what might a post-neoliberal document and uh, 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 post-neoliberal world for services um, uh, for people with intellectual disability start to evolve that looks different. So the first one is counter publics. This has been discussed by Stacey Clifford Simplican and we'd like to hear more from her about this. The idea of counter publics started in the 1980s with gay bars where you express rather than suppress difference. And so we come back to that notion, to what degree are people with intellectual disabilities different? The public certainly find them different and a bit puzzling and slightly alarming. Um, we have uh, not been interested in wanting to underline difference. Um, but here we have a counter public that, that says um, you go somewhere where actually you can feel free. Um, and that that difference might be uh, somewhere where you raise awareness, speak your own mind, feel free. Um, and so what we've been doing in the Disability Commission and in, in and an individualist um, strategy is separating people with ID, ID. Instead, can we develop environments where connections um, and similarities are the name of the game? Um, 
uh, we've written briefly before and uh, say a bit in the book about enabling environments. Um, it's a, a, a Royal College of Psychiatrists initiative, very exciting, I think, um, that about that talks about how does an environment draw families in rather than take an adversarial position towards them, um, uh, make a difference to them, make it an environment they belong to. Um, uh, travel is obviously one of the issues that gets in the way of that. But let's emphasize the similarities between staff and families rather than articulate them. Um, and, and where are the environments that seek to engender connection? Um, Patrick McKinney's written a lot about Lash, um, as has David Trina. Um, and there's also um, thinking about Camp Hill communities, which certainly in the UK are, are doing their best to stay under the radar so that people don't pay too much attention um, to what they do. I mean, these are environments that don't generally take the most distressed and disturbed people. But I, uh, we do believe that these are places that we could be in conversation with. Uh, some of them are very innovative. Uh, one of the Camp Hill communities in Scotland um, was experimenting with um, uh, approaches to uh, the provision of care using European social pedagogy. Um, there are some, some places where people think differently about how the environment might work. Um, and I think the notion of a counter-public might be worth further exploring. This fantastic study um, starts thinking, how do you reduce violence in ways that are not about the law and, and rights and the criminal justice system? It takes a public health initiative. It's completely different. Scotland in 2005 was found to be the most violent country in the developed world. And they decided to take a public health approach rather than a criminal justice approach. Um, and and uh, if you look at the bottom here, Crichton says in, in a decade, they reduced homicides by 10 percent and 60 percent. And it's an extraordinary thing. And, and you know, the, the, the description of the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit is a fantastic accounting of what was done. Um, and it, it treats violence as preventable disease um, in the same way that um, there have been public health initiatives to reduce suicides, where you do things like look at a hot spot and, and build it differently so that it's difficult to climb onto a bridge uh, where you, that moment where you might um, take your life is, is, is made. Uh, you, you have to just stop and pause because you can't access it. Um, and preventable disease it, uh, that requires multiple inputs. They were aware, of course, Scotland is famously drunk, um, that um, most violence is fueled by alcohol. And so they whacked up the tax on alcohol to start uh, reducing one of the precipitants of violence. But they also funded local projects based on these kinds of relational principles, um, mobilization of wider community members, provision of personal supportive relationships and a belief in connection and opportunity as an antidote to violence. Um, and I love that idea that you've got a little, a, a large pool of money that is trusting community members with little projects um, that are that are based on those sorts of ways of of working um, that just change a society. Um, it does seem to me that those sorts of initiatives could start to uh, reel back some of the. Um, uh, harassment and violence that people with intellectual disabilities experience um, in many communities. Um, and, and they just seem to me wonderfully exciting. And it's well evident there's a research unit accompanying it. Um, and um, I'd love to see more of that happening. And can we minimize monitoring? Obviously, I, I, we go back to power and um, the uh, enormous amount of money that goes on surveillance and on legal inquiries. Um, the uh, Disability Commission itself, I think, costs 528 million Australian dollars, four years. Is it going to make that much difference? What would happen if we didn't monitor um, and Finland, it turns out, abolished school inspections in the early 1990s. They stopped wanting to control. They did want to steer. How do you steer a, 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 a service that you don't control? You provide information, support and funding. Um, their, their education system trusts staff, lets schools decide. 
what they should be doing. Um, and, uh, and for example, for people with intellectual disabilities, there is no single idea about whether they should be in a special school or they should be in an integrated school. It is determined on uh, a school by school uh, 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 basis, on the basis of teachers who make a decision about how the child they're teaching is getting on. There is autonomy, which is high at all levels. We, we look at how neoliberalism has taken professional autonomy, undermined it. Um, and uh, they made teaching high status, um, so five year training, not three, and their pay uh, was substantially increased. And one of the ways they were able to do that was because they stopped worrying about class sizes. They decided that an experienced skilled teacher could manage classes. Um, and that um, if you endlessly worry about class size as your first concern, you end up bringing into teaching people who aren't necessarily particularly talented to teachers. Um, and, and if you release yourself from that concern, you will get an excellent uh, an excellent service, which is what they have. There are no national tests for pupils. And the UK, I'm not sure about the education system in uh, Australia, um, but teachers are, you know, constantly uh, having to manage and prepare people for tests. Um, and that is not happening. And interestingly, your particular concern is to develop people's capability for self-assessment to support self-knowledge and study skills very different way of thinking about how we might do things so this is a review of the Finnish educational system independent review published by bastos um, it is very different from neoliberal ways of organizing things and they're interested in the quality of formative performances not just a short-term quest for quantitative results and again if we go back to Deleuze you put time in formative processes time is one of the key things um, that makes it a non-neoliberal approach so gone on a little longer conclusions commission led astray by exhausted neoliberal ideology they continue to promote voice choice and work and squander time and resource on surveillance, leading to stale recommendations. I mean, Richard and I read it, uh, um, were astonished on the other side of the world. It could be so similar to the ideas that are operating in our country. It just seems extraordinary that a very small, narrow range of ideas are just being reproduced everywhere, which is what cultural homogenization critique is saying. So can we repurpose some of the finance that we currently spend on monitoring legal inquiries to reduce violence, rebuild fractured communities using public health initiatives, create counter publics of fun and belonging that make space for innovation? This is the new world we envisage. We welcome your comments. Thank you so much. I think you've 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 answered a lot of people's questions um, <laughs> as you've gone along. Um, if we just go back to the beginning uh, for a minute uh, and the easy read that generated quite a lot of, uh, uh, of questions. Um, I just want to make one comment. Do you think that sometimes uh, the easy read or the plain English sort of uh, translations of things actually serve a purpose of enabling support workers to understand difficult concepts and therefore to be able to explain them to people verbally? Um, what's the I Sorry, go on. No, no, I'm, yeah, yeah. I suppose, yes, I mean, I think the findings are the findings, um, but I myself have used the um, Books Without Words, um, which were a series of um, books, you know, covering things like going to the dentist, um, a funeral, that kind of thing. Moving into a group um, home. And it serves as a kind of mediation, I think, between the kind of... I think the relationship's really important between the two people, but they do form a sort of, if you like, a can form a kind of communicative bridge because actually you're giving the information orally but you've got, if you like, visual cueing as well. I mean, they don't actually have words, so they're not te they're not technically kind of accessible in that kind of sense. And they were so they, produced as words. Yeah. So they, but they, I think they do. They encourage. Um, I think they can help um, get messages across. But quite a lot of the way they've got these different symbols. I mean, I look at them, I kind of think, well, I wouldn't know what that says. <laughs> um, you know, and you've got like a doctor with a stethoscope and um 
and I think, you know, I think we've laid out what the sort of, in a sense, a kind of uh, critique of that. Um, I think, yes, I think a lot of the, a lot of the culture actually is, is oral. It's about people you trust, uh, people you like. Um, I think that sometimes it can provide rather like books without words. Maybe sometimes it can provide some kind of bridging. Um, but I think it's, it's sort of, it feels overused. I think that, not overused, but you know what I mean? It's sort of, it doesn't do exactly what you think it is, that somehow you can pick it up and understand. People might not be familiar with the UK um, books without words, but I think what you're talking about is what we might call easy read, which is very minimal words and pictures, right. as opposed to uh, plain English or plain language, which is often a different approach to writing a, um, a lower literacy level for a lower literacy yeah, level. Yeah. Um, but Teresa says, and she makes a very important comment, I think, about researchers. She says, adherence to this accessible information principles ignores what we know about information processing and skills required for reading comprehension um, and reliance on linguistic understanding. And it ignores all the research evidence, which is, I think, what you're saying. Yeah. But researchers have been very complicit in this, in promoting putting pictures, for example, into consent forms. Um, and actually, uh, that's now become sort of something that has to be there. Mm -hmm. And we've trained ethics committees to look for it. So we've <laughs> created this whole way of being that is, is built on something that's for which there's no evidence. Absolutely. Well, it's that distortion of reality, isn't it? You're so, the, it, it, you become <laughs> you become it for the best of reasons. You become complicit in, in a sense. <laughs> and it, I think it goes to the comment that somebody made earlier that I think you made it, Jennifer. People are are afraid to speak out or to say something that's counter to the sort of dominant ideology. So you go along with it, and I think that's what's mm -hmm. happened certainly in the communication sort of space. Oh, and a piece of research uh, Alison Pilnick led on in our uh, transition project was looking at um, the school leavers meeting where the staff, uh, uh, the staff, you know, there's only one way. We can't tell a man called Alec that he can't join the police because he's not bright enough. Um, and so the whole, you know, the whole meeting grinds to a halt as everybody worries about Alec and what they're going to say. But the staff are, are in a position of having to um, uh, present themselves as good people and not be judged as, as bad people who are going to disappoint Alec and tell him he can't do something. Uh, and so the mother is the one who is eventually has to take responsibility for this meeting and say, Alec, you can't join the police now, maybe later. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but I, 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 yes, I, I think it's been quite an oppressive uh, thing. And I, and I worry that lots of qualitative research with staff, it, they're just trying to work out what's the right thing to say. What they think is another matter entirely. Um, but if you're not careful, they're just trying to say the right thing so that you'll think they're OK. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> so there's a very interesting comment from somebody that's, that is very short and sharp, but raises, I think, a big issue that you might want to think about. The person says public health is aligned with a medical model and not a social model. Well, you can argue it is it's health getting involved. Well, Richard knows more about this than I do, but it is health getting involved with social uh, concerns that social influences on health, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, well, I think that. Although it's called public health, I think it it incorporates the social by its by its. Um, by its very nature. Um, if you look at, you know, there are classic things about, you know, public health and you say you look at a condition um, or a, or something like that and you find out actually the amount that's amenable, if you like, to some kind of medical intervention is, is minimal. It's as all the doctors and drains stuff. Actually, what you do is if you fix the drains, you get far bigger impact than actually kind of like doubling the number of doctors or getting better antibiotics. So it's in a sense it the public health thing is actually has that really wide purview. And it also kind of says, well, what are the like, if you like, what are the family, what are the individuals um contributions to this? 
Um, so if you're doing something on smoking, you then have to look at like, well, well, who smokes, who doesn't smoke? Why do people smoke? You know what I mean? It's a much wider thing. It's not, although it's called public health, it's not a sort of medical driven model. It's very much a holistic thing. It's really. I suppose, so I would also say, I, I wonder when we move on from this social medical dichotomy. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's unhelpful. It's absolutely unhelpful. And, and I guess we talk a lot here about the social determinants of health. Um, and so it is that much broader thing. And yes, but it all, often comes back to, you know, doctors and nurses type of health. That's the danger. It's got a very mm. strong pull. But I think that's a very I good think... response, though, Richard. It's really helpful. Yeah. And I think the other thing is interesting that some of this stuff, I mean, like, belonging of things i think there are geographers and social scientists i mean there's anthropologists they're economists there's lots of people who are making interesting are doing interesting research in terms of this group and i think that argues for having these very diverse um research groupings and thinkings because i think that in a sense and you're not forced to look down, down one lens you can say well what do the geographers say about the influence of place in terms of connection and and people with intellectual disability so i think it just widens that whole kind of way of thinking and one of my favorite doctors talks about you know loneliness is actually being one of the major major yes. health issues that has really detrimental impacts on people's people's health and we, we yeah more than smoking that. more than smoking yeah that connection um there's a there's a there's a comment from from uh Laura who says and it's it's worth thinking about this Jennifer in terms of I think the 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 Dutch system and the, their training that they have for workers. She says, how do you see the disability sector as increasing the status of disability support work? In my experience, and she's talking about the Australian experience, I see that this seems to be a transient job rather than a respected mm -hmm. profession, which, you know, in part contributes to the high turnover of staff. And, and my question has always been, do we have to do it like that? Does it have to be a low status job? So what do you know from elsewhere, Jennifer, and what would you say? Well, I mean, as you say, the Dutch, uh, I looked at one Dutch study uh, uh, that uh, Paula Sturkenberg did, which was around attachment, uh, um, but two thirds of those staff were graduates. It's a very different experience from uh, the staff pool that we um, have in, uh, in the UK and I think you in Australia. Um, and uh, uh, I do feel that we should be, um, yeah, uh, seeing it as a much more complicated job. And I think in general, that certainly for people who are challenging, uh, there's a growing evidence that we also talk about um, uh, that people are constantly, because they, the policy makers and politicians meet um, relatively mildly disabled, untroubled people in advocacy groups, and they know all about people with Down syndrome, um, that, who are actors and so on, uh, that they completely underestimate how how disturbed and challenging um, and how difficult many of our clients are and how flexible the staff have to be to turn their hand to these very different people um and uh, uh and and i i certainly feel that for um the services for people who are the 45 40 percent roughly the people who are challenging um do does need to be better paid higher status treated the same way as as Finnish education has has done to actually make progress and not just have a rapidly turno rapid turnover of minimally trained staff and as soon as they get experience they're gone um yes yes right on it's the issue I think that it's become you know a support worker can be almost anybody off the street and and the expectation that the consumer the person with disability will be able to direct them um, and everything will be all right it's like that actually doesn't work for people with intellectual disabilities you need a, it's a much more complicated relationship 
uh, yes. that they have to be, isn't there? It's, yes, and I mean, I, I don't, I don't have evidence of it, but I know the Tizard Centre said that that was funded by getting some regional health authority people to come into a unit for people with disturbed, who are very disturbed, who all come away, you know, with their hand to their brow, saying, "Gosh, I didn't realise these people were so distressed and so difficult." And that was our experience in Nottingham, when our chief executive came to our rather ropey unit, and suddenly we got a multi-million pound new unit that was custom built and and designed by architects. Um, people are underestimating how difficult the people are. Um, and because we don't want to be making nasty judgments and describing people in negative ways, it's a difficult thing to share. Yeah, I think, I mean, you you always move towards the people who have, who have more challenging uh, situations um, and are more complex. But I think the issue is also similar for some of the people with milder intellectual disability, the, the skills that you need to support those people to be engaged in, co-production, co-design in public speaking and things are also quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And we've just been evaluating one of the organisations and, you know, they do it really well and it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. and resources. Yeah, yeah. One of the people themselves talked about, well, this is very different from just having a support worker come with you. You mm -hmm. know, it's it, it takes a whole organisation to think about how to support people well um and a range of skills i think we shouldn't underestimate it um, oh and and the, uh, your research with whoever it was from the neighborhood houses in in australia which is saying you've got a whole set of support workers whose task is to come you, you don't even come with your own staff that you know you get somebody who who accompanies you and sits there and doesn't know you from adam that's right so we're wasting so much money aren't we when we yes when we're doing it that way yeah yeah, yeah. um there's a there's a really nice comment and I think it's probably a good place to, to finish um it says this is an excellent critique of the disability role commission which I've never heard before uh you should read the rapid uh <laughs> thank you in Aust th thank you in Australia politicians and the general community seem to have a faith in role commissions and immediately appeal to role to a role commission to solve deep-seated problems this is despite the fact that many seem to be ineffective so why do we still have such trust in royal commissions when they achieve so little? <laughs> do you have any Indeed. reply to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's change it. <laughs> <laughs> why do yeah. we keep doing the same thing? I don't know, because we're near liberal cultures. Um, let's have a period of experimentation. Richard, have you got any last words? Um, well, I think, again, I suppose it's that delurs and repetitions, isn't it? So uh, one hopes that actually the repetition of having royal commissions is one of those things that we can then think about. Because I think there's a sort of sense of, well, they're invested with sort of like authority and they've got senior lawyers and they take <laughs> every stuff. And, and they've got this sort of spurious authority. And I think that... They need I think it needs unpacking as to why we 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 need to relook at that. We need to change ourselves a bit or and think, well, why why does that get us any further? Because I don't think it does. But it's one of those, it's a bit like scandals. It's kind of like, which we also touch on in the book, is kind of like, can we rethink how scan how because there's a pattern to how scandals unfold and how can we then think about those differently? OK, so I'm going to call it to a quits and say again, thank you so much for this afternoon. It, it's been absolutely fascinating. And I think you bring a lot of ideas to us that actually uh, aren't circulating particularly well in Australia. And, you know, I think a book tour uh, in Australia of the book <laughs> is the thing we need to plan for next year. And we can also promote the special issue. Um, so please think about that in your sort of non-working lives. And so once again, thank you very much, Richard and Jennifer. It's been great. And thank you very much indeed. Absolutely, absolutely. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.